Pinstripe is felt appropriate for today's episode. Welcome everybody to Bounce Off, the number one slam ball podcast worldwide. Today's headlines after Thursday night's action, the mob reached 10 wins, zero losses. The buzz saw a little bit of offensive punch and Nathan Carstens has the game of his slam ball career. All of that coming up as we talk about the three games that happened last night in Slam Ball. We will start with Mob versus Buzzsaw, which is best team in the league versus second best team in the league. Then we go to Slashers, third best team in the league versus the Ozone, who have a lot to prove coming into week three. And then we will talk about the main event matchup, which, spoilers, is Mob versus Slashers. But I think we'll spend a lot of time on game one because that's got the most to talk about. And then we'll spend a little bit less on games two and game three and then we'll finish up with a preview of tonight's matchups which are a very nice time for the UK sadly I'm working they start at 9 p.m our time uh, and I'm at work till 10 so by the time I get home they'll have finished but that means I can watch it I can skip through the ads I can take notes and tomorrow's episode will be super comprehensive but we have last night's matchups to get to before we do I actually need to very quickly look up what tonight's matches are Okay, back after a quick Google search so I could find out what tonight's matchups are. We will start our discussion today with uh, an interesting note. So the commentary team has stayed similar to last week. John Schriffen is the voice of Slam Ball, as he is calling himself on the call. So that's fine. And um, Stormy Bonatone is is back as the the secondary and the courtside uh, interviewer. And they've brought in, as the third person this week, without having announced it pre-game or anything, that it was going to be Jelani Janice, who is considered one of the best slam ball players of all time, and is currently head coach of the Griffs. I find this to be interesting, because I don't think he'll be commentating tonight with his team in action. But does that mean they're going to have this week just be them cycling through the different coaches? So it'll be a coach that isn't playing each night? In which case, who are you going to get tonight? Is it going to be... Coach Hernando from The Buzz? Is it going to be Coach Kirsch from The Mob? Is it going to be somebody else? Are we going to have Coach uh, Fletcher from The Slashers? Is it going to be TA for The Ozone? I think out of all those, um, Coach Hernando from The Buzz makes the most sense. Uh, Alternatively, Coach Kirsch. But I think that Buzzsaw and Hernando makes more sense. And with Game 1, I am going to touch a lot on The Buzzsaw. So Game 1 was Mob versus Buzz. And... I think, ev- so So from week one, it has been a definitive, the Mob are the best team in slam ball and the Buzz are the second best team. If I'm putting like tiers together, I think the Mob are, are in a tier on their own because they they have been so good and no one can question that. And then I think that the Slashers and Buzzsaw are together. Buzzsaw maybe are, are ahead of the Slashers, but the two those two teams are quite close in terms of comparison, right? But we've seen the Slashers face the mob three times after last night. And none of those times have they looked like they could put something together over the course of a whole game to slow down the mob team, right? Whether it be offensively or defensively, they can't put a full game together. The buzz by comparison, as Coach Hernando was very willing to point out to me on Twitter, uh, he said they held the, the mob to their lowest score all season. That's not quite right. But what the Buzz have been good at as a team who are very defensively minded is they have held the Mob to their third and fourth lowest games of the season, right? The Buzz are incredibly good defensively. And that's something I want to hit on from the off, right? In terms of, I believe, with LBRs, it should still be the same after last night. Taekwon Scott is first in the league. Malik abdul Haq is second, right? This, this is a team that gets after loose balls, it is a team where I believe the strategy to beat the mob is you need to have a stopper who is good, um, better than good. I've been I've been unfair on Taekwon Scott now looking at his stats more closely. But what I have always maintained is that what he is good at is you cannot get past him if you're just driving to the hoop. And he stops the majority, if not close to like 90%, of single cut actions that you're getting at the basket, right? In order to stop the mob, you need a stopper who can do that at minimum, so no drives allowed, and you're stopping like 90% of their two-man game, so single cut off the island. And then you need what the buzz are starting to develop, which is great and improving, like I'm saying, perimeter defense, right? 
So you need to be able to play great perimeter defense to impede the mob from getting into the traps and also do that without giving up unnecessary violations that give them a bunch of bonus points, which some teams struggle to do. The Buzz are getting better at doing that. They're already probably the best team in the league at that, but they're also getting better at doing that. And what's adding to this is that last night for the first time, we had a member of the Slam Ball League, like an official of the league, Rob Wilson, who's a former player, former first round pick uh, back in 2002, a guy who's spent a lot of his life dedicated to Slam Ball, who is now in charge of player and team relations, and in terms of taking care of making sure that the referees understand the job. He was head referee for at least one of the matches, possibly all three of the matches last night. Um, I would like to ask why that has happened from a league standpoint, but I would I would expect it's uh, there have been concerns about the calls. And so the idea is put the guy who is doing the coaching for how to do the calls, make him be the guy to make the decision and explain what's going on. And so there was a lot of plays last night where people were getting bumped quotation marks going into the tramps and Rob Wilson sort of turning to them going no I'm making my call no there, there was no you need to make sure you're getting out of the way of the defender the defender doesn't need to make sure they're getting out of the way of you it's it's a thing with slam ball where in basketball if you are the defensive player and you hold your ground and the offensive player runs straight into you if you haven't moved and the offensive player runs straight into you that is an offensive turnover, defense gets the ball. Slam ball does not have that, that's called a charge. Slam ball does not have charges, but they do have no calls. And no calls are occurring, or should be occurring, if an offensive player doesn't try to avoid the defensive player. The defensive player can't move into the path, can't make contact with the guy running into the tramps. But if they're stood perfectly still, the offensive player needs to make an effort to get around the defender. And if they're not doing that, then there's no reason for the uh, referee staff to make a call against the defense because the defense is doing their job, the offense isn't doing theirs. Defense doesn't get benefit from that outside of the fact that they're not giving away points. Right. So disciplined defense does even better for the buzz when Rob Wilson is on the call and is keeping everything as precise as possible. A follow-up to this is, and I, I can't tell watching it, I can't tell watching it, which is just the, the honest reality, um... I'd love to go back and I'd love to have opportunities with with my time to go back and look at the matches more. Um, but the buzz have been in in the first game that they had with the the mob that Coach Planels was telling me was the lowest they've ever scored, which was a fifty point game, I believe. Um, the buzz the the mob had fourteen turnovers, which is the most they've had all season. Until last night's game against the uh, the Buzz, which ended with them also having 14 turnovers. Okay, so I can't tell in watching the games if, and this is on me, but I can't see if the Buzz are the ones causing the turnovers or if it is coming in games, like the Buzz happen to be playing in games where the Mob are not playing as well when it comes to like holding the ball. And I think that's a bit too much serendipity to place on the situation. There must be something that the buzz are doing to get these turnovers. I'm just not seeing it as of right now. And that's on me. Um, but ultimately, this game ended, 20, uh, ended with a 23-point win for the mob, right? It was 53-30. to 30. So even if the buzz, as I'm telling you right now, have a really good stopper, or you know, good stopper to really good stopper, uh, who can stop the majority of, of simple plays and needs more complex stuff to beat him, and really good perimeter defense, and an additional thing, which is probably, I would say that the Slashers have a, have a more, are better at executing a more complex offense than the Buzzsaw are, but I think for sure the Buzz have got the third best strategic offense in the league, right? So they've got a top three strategic offense, and they are one of the best defensive teams. So why are they not able to close the gap against the mob and why is this still yes they're holding them to a certain amount but they're not balancing it with scoring the answer is as simple as they're just not scoring enough looking at games that teams are playing majority of teams are winning games when at least three of their players are in double digit scoring or in the case of some slashers wins you have a team where two players are scoring 20 plus points right but to get a win 
the majority of teams are wanting to have three guys score double digits. And half, more than half of the buzzsaws wins this season have come in games where that's not the case. And it's all been defensive pressure. Now, in those games, you've had guys like mainly Jamal Barnes Jr., who are scoring close to 20 out of nowhere to, to bump them up and, and get them the win. But overall, their offense isn't doing as well as other teams. Now, is this tiredness? This was pointed out by the commentary last night that the mob have got a lot of energy in the first half, and then they maintain that energy in the second half, whereas most other teams aren't able to do it. And the, the best way to get past Taekwon Scott as stopper, as shown last night, is to go at him fast and to just get to the rim. The same strategy that the mob are using for all of their face-offs, which is just go to the rim as fast as you can. It's the same strategy they're using to get past Taekwon Scott as stopper. It's just go to the rim as fast as you can. So they've got the energy to keep that up all game. Taekwon Scott doesn't have the energy to keep up playing stopper all game. And most guys don't. It's freak athletes that are able to play stopper the entire game. Um, but he's not able to keep up with that the whole time. And the perimeter defense isn't able to stay on top of, at times, three cutting players coming off the island for the mob. That's like a, a huge thing that they have to deal with, right? So tiredness is a big point as to why it's difficult to stop the mob. The buzz, like I'm saying right now, I think if a team is going to beat them, it is the buzz. But I think they need an offensive punch to get to that stage. Where that's going to come from, I do not see it right now. We'll talk about that later on, or at minimum, when we get to this week in Slam Ball on Tuesday. But tiredness is a big thing. The second thing is, like I say, they need an offensive punch. Here's where I'm going to break down numbers for you. If we're looking at points per game for the whole league, right, the whole league, the first person to appear from the buzzsaw is Jamal Barnes Jr. with 12.8 points per game. Okay, that is 10th in the whole league. So out of, out of 60 players involved in slam ball, he is 10th in the league, which is, is good. But that is your highest scoring guy on the second best team. So they are winning games through defense, right? Because the rest of the team, Malik abdul Haq is next for the team in terms of points per game with 7.4, which puts him 24th in the league. So nearly halfway. Their next two guys are Ralph Bellamy at 6.7 and Terrell Howard at six points per game. And these guys are 31st and 33rd respectively. So their next three biggest scorers outside of Jamal Barnes Jr. are all coming in like the mid-range of scoring in the league or close to it. You, could, you know, Malik Hack's higher than that. But you've got one guy who's averaging 12.8, so 13 points per game. You have no one else averaging close to double digits. And you need at least, you know, you need at least two guys doing double digits, ideally three to get wins or huge scoring outbursts from someone like Jamal Barnes Jr. and really good defense from the rest of the team. And they are not able to do that, right? By comparison's sake, and I know that this is a lofty comparison, but if the mob, if, if the buzz want to be considered the, the best team in the league, minimum want to be considered the second best team in the league, you have to compare them to the team that are 10 and 0, right? And that have beaten them. And that's the mob. By comparison, we've got Jamal Barnes Jr. is 10th, and then the next highest scorer on the buzz is 24th. There are five mob players from the seven-man roster who are in the top 20 in scoring, including Gage Smith, their stopper, who is 20th, right? You have got five of your entire roster in the top 20 in scoring is ridiculous offensive numbers. And... Again, so so the buzz are, are doing a fine job of, of defending that. But you cannot beat this team with a huge number of scores, etc., with an offense that is based around well, an offense that's based around your defense, and then one guy who can score in double digits and Malik Abdul Hat can do it, but not consistently, and no one else is doing it to that same consistent level. Ralph Bellamy is the guy that the, the commentary is at least talking about is he should be the person that's stepping up. And um, I think that's definitely something to look at. Is, is someone on this team, Jamal Barnes Jr. needs to increase his scoring generally as, as your lead scorer, your lead offensive guy. And then the rest of the team needs to increase it as well. Somebody else needs to be that second double digits per game guy. Should be Malik abdul Haq, Might be Ralph Bellamy. We will see. Why aren't they scoring a lot though? That's the question. And my assumption which has been proven right through the stats, is turnovers are an issue for this team. So 
They are the highest turnover per game team with 16.3 turnovers per game, which is 6.6 behind the mob who are in first place, right? So the mob give away 9.7 turnovers per game. Again, 14 per game or, you know, double digits per game against the buzz. So clearly there's defensive pressure there. But the buzz are giving away a league high 16.3 turnovers per game, which is not good enough to beat a team that is this good offensively and on the fast break. Right. If your defense is doing enough to stop them, your offense needs to be complete enough to score on the other end. And the thing is that the majority of these turnovers are coming from Terrell Howard, who is your starting handler, and Jamal Barnes Jr., who is your number one offensive option, who coming into the weekend were sixth and seventh in turnover per game, turnovers per game, respectively. And in terms of totals, Malik abdul Haq, who we just talked about, is maybe your second best offensive player. He is top six in total turnovers over the course of the season after last night. Right? They are very good and very scrappy defensively, but do they give it back on the offensive end? By the turnovers that they're giving away and the fact that their offense is, is, is good, but they're not able to complete passes. And sometimes it comes down to just JBJ needs to make a lot of big dunks. And that's the end of the conversation for them, right? The buzz are so close because their defense is so good, but their offense has got a lot of catching up to do. And that's that's where we end the conversation on who's going to beat the mob. The answer is probably the buzz, but they need a lot more offensive firepower. And in a league where you don't do trades, there's no free agency, there is no trade deadline, any of this. In this league, you are not going to get that offensive punch from anywhere unless injuries persist for your team and you have to take someone off of the the uh, taxi squad who ends up being an amazing scorer, right? You're not getting that in slam ball. So the buzz are the closest to beating the mob because their defense is so good. But they're also, you know, th- there are other teams that have held the mob to less points. Granted, it's the Griffs and it's the Ozone who they have only played once. Uh, they've never played the Lava, but I don't think, given how the Lava's games have gone, I don't think the Lava are going to be the people to stop them all either. The Buzz saw have a good defense, great defense, elite defense. Whatever you want to say, they've got a good defense. The offense needs something. Um, I'm going to put it to the guys that this week in Slam Ball on Tuesday, but if, if in a, a totally random universe, right, if there was a trade that you could do and say for some reason, say the Lava, right, are like, oh, Bryce Marine is, is c- consistently injured. We've decided we just want someone who's going to be available, right? And you as the the buzzsaw decide that, do you know what? We need offensive firepower. We'll trade you two guys. We'll take Bryce Marine. And all of a sudden, you've got a 24-point-per-game scorer going on to this team that adds a lot, right? And I think that's what the buzz need. And I don't think you can do that with the way Slam Ball's league is constructed right now. I think you have the team you have. And so that scoring needs to come from somewhere else. Malik abdul Haq, get more, get more points per game. You're doing great, but get more. Ralph Bellamy, step up to where you were expected to be first weekend. Uh, Jamal Barnes Jr., just up those numbers a little bit. And keep control of the ball. If the offense is getting too complex or too complicated, take a step back and change the approach that you're going with. Because... 16.3 turnovers per game higher than the teams that are losing a bunch. If you shore up those turnover numbers, if you can find more scoring because you're not turning the ball over as much, that does a lot better. And obviously they're the second best team in the league, but if you're the second best team in the league, that's second place. And I feel like there are a lot of teams and a lot of athletes and a lot of pro players who would say that's not good enough. First is all we want. So... I think it's interesting what Gage Smith said post-game for this match last night, where he said, these are the two teams that are going to be in the final, obviously the mob winning. But even the mob are looking at the buzzsaw and saying, this is the team that we're going to have to beat at the end. So the buzzsaw should be saying, this is the team we're going to have to beat at the end, undoubtedly. So we need to prepare for that, and we need to look at ways that we can improve our scoring and decreasing our turnovers, which should improve our scoring. That's a lot on the buzz. I... I've been accused of being very critical of them. Here's the truth. Buzz are the second best team in the league. No one is doubting that. They could probably beat the mob. Best of the league, possibly. But you need more scoring. That's a fact. You need less turnovers. That's a fact. And you need some, I guess it's conditioning. I'm not sitting here saying I'm better at this. 
I'm never going to be the person that sat here saying I'm better at doing any of these things. I'm not saying I've got anywhere near the best conditioning of even a coach in this league, right? Think of, think of the least physically adept coach in slam ball. They are going to outpace me in every single category, right? That's not the place this is coming from. But this is from looking at the game and saying a lot more points were scored in the third than were throughout the rest of the game because tiredness creeps in. And ultimately, the mob can take advantage of that by going fast and going fast and going fast. Their highest points of the game were in the third quarter. It was also the highest points of the game in their last game of the night. Um, I compared the mob earlier this season to the 2004 Pistons. And other people have jokingly compared them to like the 2016 Golden State Warriors. And given that they are resting their best player when they're up high... And also getting their biggest scoring punch in the third quarter. Maybe there's something to that. Uh, in terms of the mob in this game, right? So we talked about the buzz a lot there. The mob aren't scrubs. And the thing I want to point out in this game, because there, there comes a point where we just, we've talked about them so much and, and there's only so much I can say, that now I want to stress their versatility. So <clears throat> I said preseason, I thought Brandon Simpson was a potential all-star in the league. And before anyone says anything, Jamal Barnes Jr. for the buzzsaw was my other pick for uh, an all-star. I thought Brandon Simpson could be an all-star. And he's coming off the bench for the mob. And I think you there, that's a crazy fifth man to have, is Brandon Simpson. Because this guy is as big as some of the stoppers. And is, has been drilled and coached to play his role. And that is to be part of the flow of the offense that the mob have. And then if it's breaking down, guess what? He just kind of muscles his way into the tramps and can compete with the stoppers for size. And that's such a unique fifth, like, you know, third option, fifth option, the guy off the bench for this team. Crazy that Brandon Simpson's a guy that's coming off the bench for this team, right? And then the other thing about versatility is they kind of have three stoppers, which is interesting. So, Gage Smith is a is you know MVP of the league right now, best stopper in, in slam ball, but is a gunner by heart, and so can play the gunner position and score a bunch of points on that end. But he has to play stopper. There are times where he has to come up to play offense because he wants to score. And last night, the guy who was flirting or or flitting in to cover for him was Cam Hollins, who in the spot minutes he was playing at stopper played really, really well and got a number of blocks, actually, very quickly. While I have you here, dear viewer, I'm going to do a quick check of something I should have done before, which is how many stops did Cam Hollins get in the first place? Um, he got two. So two stops, eight stops for Gage Smith and 14 LBR. Um, so yeah, it's it's... They have versatility from the standpoint of multiple guys can do multiple things. And that's, again, you've also then got Deontay Bird, who's the, all right, Gage, you've played the full game. Let's get your rest before the main event. Let's bring out Deontay Bird. Oh, he's a big physical body and he can set screens in the half court. That's a really good third option, right, for your stopper. And the other thing I want to point out that was, that was noted by commentary, because Brendan Kirsch said it in, in his huddle, is that the mob were now focusing on clock management in games, right? So they are now at the stage where they are trying to preserve their bodies for playoffs, which is in two weeks' time. And so what are they doing? They're running up the score in the first half or in the third quarter. Again, we've just talked about it in this game and in the main event. Their highest scoring quarter was the third. Once they have a comfortable lead, slam balls are running clock game. And maybe what I'm about to talk about is bad for the league, is bad for slam ball, is bad for the development. But the mob have got a high score going into the fourth. The directive from Coach Kirsch is hold the ball, use the clock, run our plays effectively and and use as much time as possible. He has said, and it was quoted by, by Stormy Bonatone on, on, on the show last night, on the, on, the, on the game's words. I've been up since 4 a.m. Um, it was noted that Kirsch wants his guys playing at full speed because to do anything less is what promotes the idea of injuries, right? Is, is, is injury concern. And so they're not going at half speed, but they're taking their time to set up the offense and then running at full speed. And so they're keeping themselves warm and they're running a good offense, including in the fourth quarter, a four-man play that involved 
two guys cutting in and around the bottom tramp to just create the air that something was happening and then Gage Smith screaming in from nowhere to get a dunk. That was kind of crazy. So the mob have got versatility on top of everything else we've talked about so far this season in terms of coaching, in terms of defense, in terms of whatever. And now they've also got this strategy of we're going to ice out games by having a high score early and then just playing to the, to the clock for the fourth. And that's... Is that bad for the league? Is that boring to watch? Maybe. But I also think teams are really behind the mob right now. So fans are really behind the mob right now. If I said teams there. Fans are really behind the mob right now. So it can't be that bad. But we'll see. You know, this is only season one. If we end season one and it's a complete shutout for the mob, some people will be happy. Other people will say this is the death of the league after week, after season one. So we'll see. If anyone's going to beat them, probably going to be the buzz. Um, could be the Slashers. Could be a healthy Raft team. Could be the Lava. Maybe that's the weirdness of this league. Maybe the Lava can only beat them all. They've never, they've not played yet. So we will find out. Have they got a game this weekend? They should have a game this weekend. Because if they don't have a game this weekend, then that's going to be three weeks of season where... Yeah, they are not scheduled to play this week. That's interesting. I go back to my preseason theory that the Lava are the team that are supposed to be winning everything. And maybe you just don't want to schedule them to go up against the mob because it'll be a bad look. But this is week three, right? They need to play a game pre-playoffs or else, scary, if the Lava manage to sneak their way in, oh, well, this is why they're not playing them because of the whole scheduling happens after the week's game so that parity can be created, so that ba bad teams can play against other bad teams or not as good teams and hopefully get wins to move up the rankings, right? Um... And so if you have the mob play the 0 and 4 lava, they're going to cook them, hope, like you'd expect. And that's not good for anyone. So, yeah, I, uh, I can see why that's not happening. But if the, lava, if the lava get wins against worse teams and somehow sneak their way into the playoffs, I think it would be so funny if they're the team that beats the mob just because of out of nowhere. But that was game one. Like I said, we're going to focus on that game and then we're going to talk about the others very quickly. I'm just going to very quickly look through my notes to see if there's anything that I want to note. Um, yeah, I, so this was this was from the... Just back to my point about the the Buzz being a really good defense and their offense needs, needs some work. It needs more than some work, right? And that might sound harsh, but here's a direct quote from the 10 things to know week three of Slam Ball. They, they send a 10 things to know about this week in Slam Ball to the media before every week. And what they said is, the Buzz are second in the league in points per game allowed, so 38.4, which is, which is the best, you know, second best, second lowest number. But they are seventh in scoring with an output of 42.4 points per game, right? So they are, they are struggling to score to the degree that they are the second worst team in the league at that. That might concern you. But that's, that was the thing that I hadn't put in my earlier notes. So that's, that is, yeah, that's, that's the end of that conversation. <laughs> Buzz are probably a team that can beat the mob, but they need more offense, they need a little bit more um, longevity, conditioning, is that the word I'm looking for? Stamina, stamina is the word I'm looking for. Um, and they need to maintain that defense for the whole game. But that requires stamina, and then you need some sort of offensive output. Trade, trade for someone. That doesn't sound nice, given you're like mob, you know, Buzzsaw family, but trade for someone. We move on to game two of the night, which was Ozone versus Slashers. Slashers, third best team in the league, definitely third best team in the league, uh, going up against the Ozone, who were a team that had a lot to prove. What are they bringing to this league? They seem like the chatterboxes that don't end up doing very much. They see themselves as gritty. They are not the Buzzsaw, I will tell you that much. But I am calling this the Nathan Karsgen's defensive game. The game. The best defensive game he will have. Why am I saying that? Well, the game starts with the, the typical lineup for the Slashers, which includes Amir Smith at stopper. And Amir Smith, I have said all season so far, he is a good stopper. He is not elite. He is not great, but he will get you stops. In this game, the Ozone were cutting him to pieces. They were getting a lot of height from the bottom tramp, able to flow over him. They were getting a lot of low cuts, so they were guys going into the bottom tramp or going from the very, the, very edge of the middle of the side tramps. 
and getting a lot of cuts and passing there. It was just a lot of movement in that zone and, and Amir Smith could not stop it at all. He could not get in their way. And so much earlier in this game than usual, Nathan Carstens gets brought in. Nathan Carstens, who we'd seen previous weeks and who was a big, fat, you know, long snapper and he had a, a big fan on the commentary booth and he'd shot some four-pointers. And in this game, he comes on and immediately changes the complexion of how this game is going. Now, we get to halftime and the Ozone are still up on this team, right? We get to halftime and it's 35-28 in favour of the Ozone at halftime. But it could have been so much worse if Nathan Carsgens hadn't come in and, and saved the rest of the game for this team. Which sounds crazy for a bench stopper, which isn't, you know, isn't typically the position that is going to make a change like that. But he came in and managed to shore up the defense to a degree just by being physical in the air, okay? He ended the game with 10 stops, which is crazy coming off the bench, an additional four from Amir Smith. And it was all physicality. It was no finesse to the stopping, just all physicality, right? On top of that, the slashers just kept the offense ticking over. They were consistent. They were moving the ball. They were doing all the usual. And they looked good. And they only gave up two violations all game. They allowed scores on both of the face-offs, but they only allowed two violations, right? The key to winning a slam ball game is low violation numbers and high defensive discipline. We talked about this with the buzz. That's something they're good at is, is strong perimeter defense without giving away fouls. And that's how you can stop the mob because otherwise you just give them a bunch of bonus points. The slashers are who I noticed and who I pointed out and who uh, LaMonica Garrett pointed out as my alarm goes off at a very inopportune time. Um, they were the first ones to have strong perimeter defense against the mob. And so that is what is doing really well for the slashers in this game. Um, on top of that, they are sneaky physical in the open court. So TC2 has been touting on social media this week that he is second in the league in hits. Sorry, he's first in the league in hits. And that number just got way bigger after this night where he got four in game one and five in game two against the mob. And he's just, you know, getting more and more. And then Bradley Laubacher, who I'm very high on, and I think is like the linchpin for the offense on the on the slashers, even if it looks almost entirely like the stats go in TC2's way, Laubacher is the reason that this offense works a lot better than it worked in weekend one. Um, and he is, he is third in the league in hits. So you've got two of the top three hits guys, maybe not per game, but totals wise, um, on your team, which is really good. Really, really good. Uh, I've just got some notes here about how the game went generally, right? This is not... The Slashers won out because after the third quarter, the Ozone stayed slow. They only scored nine points in the third, whereas the Slashers got 22. So that seven-point deficit that they faced at halftime was obliterated and, and was now a six-point lead uh, going into the fourth. And, and that's hard to come back from if you've come back from halftime and get thumped like the Ozone did. So... The Slashers came out firing and, and with, you know, they've got a very complex offense and when they're able to run it, it goes well and they were getting a lot of high arching alley-oops throughout the night. And so that that's the main takeaway from this. But a couple of notes, both teams are getting away with, with side cuts, with one guy on the island throwing it up, using the guy on the island as a misdirect. Sorry, either throwing the ball to the guy cutting or using that guy cutting as a misdirect and then scoring via the island uh, and those cuts that are coming side on are very close to the baseline it's as far forward as you can get in the side tramps which means that it's right at like peripheral vision for the stopper which is not easy to get in the way of um loud but sorry crosby's getting double teamed in the open floor which in this game he had 29 points and six assists but like i'm saying i think that if you're double teaming crosby that is a misunderstanding of where the offense is coming from for the slashers and the answer is that if you if you double team him, Laubacher and Alonzo Scott are going to cut you to shreds because all of a sudden you've got two guys who've got an easy cut to the rim. And unless you have a Gage Smith or a Taekwon Scott back there to stop the two man game, you you're not you know you're not stopping this offense because it's a very good offense when they're running it, very complex, very good, uh, very time dependent. Um, they are catching the ball way better in the second half than they were in the first. And what they were doing, so like I said, they can either go, they do two guys in the bottom tramp, 
and you either tighten the jump and tie a high arching alley-oop so that it goes over the stopper just in time for the other guy to be coming up to catch the ball. But what they're also doing is a lot of fast, low passes mid-air on alley-oops so that it's going straight to the guy's hands. It's not going in front of him, it's going straight to the guy's hands and he's just got to catch it and finish it. And those were not coming off in the first quarter and those were a struggle in the game against the mob later. But what they did show is that that's part of the offense for slashers and it's part of how fast they are both teams were being very quick this game but the slashers thrived in the quickness to a higher degree fast pace low high arching passes a lot of speed and a lot of quick attacking the bottom tramp is just difficult for any defense to deal with right in terms of for the ozone side of things keith mcgee is taking a lot of physicality right a lot of physicality in the open floor for a guy who had injury concerns after weekend one, maybe not the best idea, but he is, he's getting bumped a lot and he's taking those con- that contact and still getting into the lane and still challenging the stopper and pulling off crazy moves and he's got great touch around the rim for lay-ins and really good adjustments mid-air and, and is a top scorer in this league for sure. Cujo McBuckets is, is great, but the team's just not pulling together enough. Uh, Brian Bell Anderson had his best game of, of the night, of the season, sorry with 19 points, I believe, which is crazy good for him. Um, I've, I've obviously been down on him as the season's gone on, but he's, you know, six points, nine points was his high last week. 19 is a huge jump, and it kind of came out of nowhere. Like, I did not see this happening during the game. So I don't know where it came from, but good on him. Um, and then, in the end, um, it doesn't matter too much, but to finish the game, there was another misunderstanding about the make it, break it. The, uh, the last 20 seconds of the game, if you f- intentionally foul, it gives the offense a face-off. If they make it, they get the points and possession. If they miss it, the defense gets possession. And so close games can be, can be saved by doing this. But the Ozone fouled too early and gave away three points and sucker punched themselves out of, out of the win. And what was funny was, like I said, Jelani Janice was in commentary. And if you remember to last week, his team totally lost the game because they misunderstood the break-it-take-it rule and, and just kept fouling and giving away free points and more free points and more free points. And it's just funny that he was on the call going, yep, yeah, that's not how the rule works. And I was like, yeah, you should know now. <laughs> like, that's, that's 100% what you should now know. Um, but it's, you know, it's... It's hard, but I, I don't think the Ozone... The Ozone played fine in this game. The The scoreline uh, was was not reflective of how the game went. I think overall, the 70-59. to 59. I think the Slashers definitely deserve to win, especially with that third quarter. But that scoreline, you know, looks a lot worse than it actually was, I think. Main event of the night, and I've got a lot less to say about this one just because I think we... I, this is a thing I'm noticing with Slam Ball is that because we're covering the teams earlier in the night, when we get to the main event matchup, it's not... There's not quite as much to say. In this one, what I'll say is the Mob and Slashers rivalry is alive and well. In the uh, second quarter, Justin Holloway and TC2 get into it in the open floor. Uh, Rob Wilson, again, so he's doing a great job of refereeing all night. He says that it was all on Holloway, that TC2 didn't do anything. But when you look at the replays, there's a lot of jersey grabbing and pulling from TC2, trying to get the fight started, I think. And that's, you know, take from that what you will. There's, I still don't know who started it or what happened there. But a little bit of a scuffle, which is the second time this season that the mob and the slashers have got into a bit of a scuffle. They've had to be pulled apart. Wouldn't want to be told to quit it by six foot nine big broad man Rob, uh, you know, Rob Wilson. But... He got in the way he, he called it. Um, there are a number of calls throughout the game that don't go the mob's way. And I think that's interesting to look at on the night. Now, obviously, they still haven't lost. Their offense is still that good. But if there's people in the slam ball sphere who are looking at the mob and saying, well, there's these calls that are getting missed and that call's getting missed. They shouldn't be getting these points and there's this and there's that. The fact that calls are starting to go against them, and I don't say this is intentional. I think there's been an emphasis put on some of the things that the mob are getting away with. And so now that those things aren't going in their direction, it'll be interesting to see if there's a swing of power, right? But there were bad calls on both ends. There were some calls that went against the slashers that weren't great. The slashers were sometimes being the beneficiary of some calls. And like there was a lot of 
times where two in the tramp could have been called because their timing wasn't quite as good in, in game two as it was in game one on that bottom tramp two-man game. So that's one of those things. The Slashers, like I said, sneaky, physical. TC2 ended up with seven hits in game two. So he added an 11 hit night last night. It's crazy. Commentary asks, after the little scuffle, and, and you know, Tony Cosby second's always smiling, and he's big smiles and big energy, and his team are straightforward, but he's the guy who keeps causing these kerfuffles. Um, commentary asks, are the slashers getting under the mob's skin? This was in the, the second quarter, I'll remind you. We end the half 18 to 18. Amir Smith's been taken out, except Nathan Karstens is, is playing well again. The third quarter is a 26-3 run for the mob. So a game that was tied at 18 apiece, then goes to 21 and 44. Like that. Crazy jump, right? So that's all of a sudden a 23-point lead that the mob have going into the fourth quarter. Of course, they're going to do what, what they've been told to do and ice the game. And this came from 8 of 8 on rim attacks, which is usually dunks, sometimes lay-ins. But if it was all dunks, 8 of 8 gives you 24 points. They got 23, so minimum one lay-in. But still, 8 of 8 attacking the rim. You can't if, if you can't stop them getting to the rim, you're not stopping this team. If you can't impede their progress to the tramp, you're not stopping this team. It wasn't either team's best game, but the mob proved with that third quarter, like they've been doing all season, that they're ma- they're they're capable of making third quarter, second half comebacks, or not even comebacks, they have had to do that, but but shoring up a game. I've got so many, I just, I trimmed my beard earlier. Unrelated, but that's, I'm dealing with that right now. Um, I don't think the Slashers are under the mob skin. I think the Slashers got under their own skin and, and lost this game because the mob, the mob went to business. The mob went to work. And I like the feud of the little guy with big smiles who secretly like really wants to win. Like he's having fun, he's throwing crazy stuff. He's also hitting guys a bunch because he loves the physicality and I think he wants to win. I like little smiley guy going up against serious, we're here to win, we'll have fun when we're when we're ahead mob. I like that being the feud. So bring it on, bring on more of this. Hopefully we'll see more of it throughout the weekend. Um, in terms of the schedule, it's probably, you know, we've got Slasher versus Buzz on Sunday or, you know, Saturday for everyone else that's not named me. Uh, but that, you know, Saturday night we could have Slashers versus Mob again or we could have Buzzsaw versus Mob again as the Mob take on the Griffins. So Saturday night's going to be a good one regardless. A couple of extra notes from this game. Um, Brandon Simpson gets a big dunk off a single cut on Karstens. Again, because he's got the size. Karstens is stopping guys with physicality. Here comes Brandon Simpson just bullying his way in. He is your fourth option. In this game, he or in, in game one of the night, he was actually the second guy off the bench. He wasn't even the first guy off the bench. According to the the score sheet, which I pinch of salt, but yeah, there's that, and then the slashers' offense does work. It just doesn't work against the mob because they, you know, it doesn't work against Gage Smith all the time. It can sometimes. I, I had a note uh, earlier that that um, was how do you beat Gage Smith? You throw the ball really, really high and ask Tony Crosby the second to catch it, and that's kind of what they've got to do. Uh, they can also do it with Alonzo Scott. They just need to basically time that right but they still can't get it off consistently when Deontay Bird came in to finish the game they were cooking him because he's just not on that same level and so you can get away with just throwing the ball over him repeatedly and, and getting multiple side side tramp side tramp cuts throw it over the guy and dunk on him um but you can't do that against first string second string stoppers Your fourth option is crazy. Darius Clark coming back from injury and getting into the swing of things with a big scoring output from him in the second game of the night, which I then need to check. So many stats that I forgot to note down. But 
he ended the game with 18 points, which was a, a game high. And that was coming back from an injury. It's it's just a, a very strong, very strong team. And you, you can't tell if that's purely down to coaching or if just these guys are all so damn good and how did they fall in the draft. Regardless, Mob are 10 and 0. The Buzzsaw are probably the team to beat them, but they need offensive firepower. Where's that going to come from? And Nathan Carsten said an excellent defensive game against the Ozone, but you cannot replicate what you do against the Ozone against the Mob, sadly. Two nights matchups, which are at 9 pm UK time. I am at work. Damn. Uh, it is the Griffs versus Rumble. Can the Rumble maintain the momentum from last week in their first win and move up the standings? If you want to know a little bit about how, how that first win felt for the team, there's an interview with Jayton Williams, who was the, you know, uh, Jayton, sorry, not Jayton, Jayton Williams, who was, uh, to my, to, in my mind, the late game hero for the Rumble in that matchup. Uh, he, that interview is up on, in our little network just now. It should be the last, last upload. Um, that's the question. Can the Rumble maintain that? Maintain that momentum. Can the Griffs get more offensive consistency and direction? And then Lava versus Wrath. Who's back from injury from the Wrath? Is Bryce Moraine back from injury for the Lava? Or is he taking the time that he definitely needs? Can the Wrath get into an offensive form as we're in, you know, starting week three, heading towards the playoffs? This is a team that I think could compete with the Mob if they were healthy. Can definitely compete with other teams in this league if they're healthy. But right now are an easy scheduled win for most teams. And will the Lava finally get their first win? They've yet to get any. Um, I think this is good good scheduling from the league because the Wrath are currently 500, 3-3. Three three. So if you're wanting some teams that can take losses and will take losses and allow other teams to bump up the standings, this is the team to do it. Um, do I want this to be the Lava's first win? No, because I'm a Wrath fan. But could it be? If no, one, if no one's healthy or if Ty McGee is the only guy back, then possibly. But this has been Bounce Off. I've got smaller and smaller as the day has gone on, as I shrink and shrink and shrink. I will not be live tweeting tonight's games, but you can find me on social media at Quantum Roberts, Q-U-A-N-T-U-M Roberts. Uh, I will not be talking about the games tonight because I will be working for my other job, my real job, my serious... Well, yeah. <laughs> the job I do when I'm not doing this. Um, till 10, so I will be missing the live tweets, but I will be getting content out for you tomorrow with more bounce off thank you for watching thank you for listening have a beautiful